apology from uh, our minister, uh, who will not be able to be with us this, uh, this afternoon uh, due to his cabinet commitment. And I believe the deputy minister as well um, is not is not part of the meeting. Um, honourable members, um, we we on the agenda we've got the the legal opinion. Members who were part of the meeting last um, last week would understand that when we've done the the APP of. DBE, there were issues with how uh, legally we can we can go with the with the budget process, which I think it's a matter that will affect all, even the the, the presentation today and the presentation next week. So the first item on the agenda that we have it's the is that uh, a opinion which we we, we I asked. Um, Llewellyn, to send it to all the members, I believe everybody had an opportunity to go through the the legal opinion from from Parliament. But also for purposes of us, if there are issues that we do not understand, I have asked that uh, they must arrange for us. A, it's a, I think it's Advocate Techana or who, but he is here. He's part of the meeting. Um, he's going to be with us for this uh, first item, so that we we conclude the matter of the of the legal opinion, and then we understand a uh, better how do we handle um, this presentation and the one that is coming next week. And then after that, we will have a presentation from from Sage. So I had an opportunity to to read the. The the oh okay, so we will have those two items and then we will we will close. We do not have the minutes that is now for the last week. We, it's we, are, we because we were we were waiting for this opinion. So, so I would ask then the secretariat um, to put all the minutes the the meeting the minutes of the last week and the one of this week, which is these ones now so that we adopt all the minutes next week, because I think we will be as this committee finishing with the budget process um, next week. So those are the, are, the, are, the, are the items that we are having on the, on the agenda. Um, it's those two items. I, I take it that we, we agree, or can I have a mover and a seconder of the, of the agenda? Can you hear me, Honourable Members? Yes, Honourable Adjuns. Yes, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson. Yes, I you move, can. You can continue speak. I move to adopt the agenda as it is, Chairperson. Thank you, Honourable Adjuns. Any second? Honourable Members. Ah, no pala bango pusi wonga. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, honourable members. Without the waste of any any time, honourable members, I think the the legal opinion it's straightforward. But of course, I'm not I'm not a legal person, and I'm not intending to be one in the in the nearer future. So, Mr. Tekana, are you there? Can you just lead us, Mr. Gaz? Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, can you see me now? Thank you. Um, esteemed court chairpersons. Yes. Uh, honorable members. Uh, my name is Andy Letejana. Can you hear me? Good, good afternoon. You can proceed, Mr. Tejana. Can everybody or, else or, just? Please uh, uh, mute your microphone and put yourself off video. Please, ba. Just be off the video and then 
Let's put our microphones on on mute. You can proceed, Advocate. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, our office uh, was requested to provide an opinion on the consideration and adoption of the Department of Basic Education's budget and strategic plan in view of the anticipated adjustments budget as a result of unexpected changes to the plan brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, let me preface my presentation by saying we all acknowledge that the impact of COVID-19 would lead to adjustments in the department's budget and plans. But quickly, Chairperson, I want to address you around the central theme or the kernel of our submission. Uh, the kernel of our submission is that the strategic plan, inclusive of the APP, must not be out of kilter with the appropriation bill that is currently before the NA and its committees. These must be read together and the plans are there to facilitate the passing of the appropriation bill. I will quickly deal with the regulatory environment. Um, Section 101C of the Money Bills and Related Matters Act 9 of 2009, the Money Bills Act provides as follows. After the, after the adoption of the fiscal framework, the relevant members of cabinet must table updated strategic plans for each department, public entity, or constitutional institution, which must be referred to the relevant committee for consideration and report. Now, the strategic plans, inclusive of the annual performance plan that are serving before the National Assembly in terms of the Money Bills Act and the PFMA, pertain to the appropriation bill that is currently before the NA and its committees. Um, at the heart of the aforementioned provisions is the requirement to table strategic plans in the context of the appropriation bill. The implication of not submitting a plan that speaks to the vote in the appropriation bill is that there would be a lack of information to consider the vote, and similarly, there would be a lack of any baseline to measure the effectiveness of the money, of the money spent. In our view, undoubtedly, this can lead to ineffective oversight. Section 30, subsection 1 of the, P of the PFMA prescribes that the minister may table an adjustments budget as and when necessary. Revised plans must be submitted with the adjustment budget that will be tabled sometime this year as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, if you look at section 12 of the Money Bills Act, subsection 2, it provides that an adjustments appropriation bill must be tabled with the national adjustments budget. Although we're anticipating a COVID-19 adjustments budget, the present appropriation bill is still before, is still before the NA and its committees. Accordingly, departments and ministers must still submit updated strategic plans with reference to this bill. In view of the above, it is our opinion that the updated strategic plans for each department must speak to the budget vote and put the committee in a position to adopt a report on plans and the specific vote. Furthermore, revised plans must be submitted with the adjustments budget that will be tabled sometime this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. For that reason, Chair, the appropriation bill, the strategic plan, inclusive of the APP, must thus be reported on and the vote must be adopted, notwithstanding that there would be an adjustment to the budget at a later stage. Thank you, Chairperson. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Advocate Tetiana. Uh, honorable members, I think all of us now we are at um, we are at ease because uh, that's the clarity that we we needed from 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 legal people. Um, so we will we we all understand the situation we have we are finding ourselves in as the country, and uh, it's the situation that um, is not above uh, DBE as well. So whatever that they had planned for, the reality is that it's not going to be what is going to be on the ground. And um, 
those are the, the legal the legal people are of the view that we need to adopt the the budget process of course we adopt it knowing that um, um it 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 is going to be um, to be adjusted when that time um comes so i i don't think i don't know if probably there are people that want us to engage this matter which i think it's very clear in my view and um it it lays my fears because those those are those were the issues that we were we were worried about um last week so i'll just hand to the to the members probably to to deliberate on, of, on the matter if they th- think that there is a need for us to do that uh, so that we can move to the business of the day thank you can i note hands laying here to present Yes, I'm also on the spotlight, man. Okay. All right. Um, can I, can I, can I, can I allow the chairperson of the NCOP to, to lead? No problem. Yes, chairperson, my, my take on this matter is that uh, we have our legal opinion and uh, and uh, the matter of past i mean i'm i'm actually seconding what you are saying uh, and the motivation is that this is a matter of compliance it's compliance we 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 pass that we 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 approve this and then in the medium term we're going to to change it i think it will be around july so I second the motion, uh, Chairperson. What do you suggest? Thank you, uh, Honourable Chavelang. Honourable Rotsetla? Yes, Chairperson. I I think it it will be prudent for us to agree now that uh, we have got the legal opinion. Indeed. I don't know. I thought you were sharing on it, but that uh, Chabele, it's moving that we adopt the content of the legal opinion as our stance. And therefore, for this reason, I want to second that Chabele that let's adopt that indeed the legal opinion is uh, our compass and uh, our position. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Murwatsetla. Anybody that wants to raise a view on this matter? One, two, three, it's gone. Um, advocate, sorry? No, I said, I said uh, we, we are fine. We are agreeing to adopt. No, Thank it's you. fine then. All right. Um, uh, advocate, take care of... Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time and thank you very much for your um, explanation. We are releasing you now from the meeting. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you. Okay, see you. See you. Now, honorable members, I would uh, ask the CEO, Mamu Khalane, to 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 present the 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 app of says um the the entity to to dbe over to you ma'am and um hope you are doing well in these circumstances yes uh thank you very much honorable chairperson and good afternoon to all the honorable members from says chair we are with uh, uh, one of our executive committee members, Councillor Ntantala, who is leading the delegation. Uh, the chairperson has got a bereavement and he apologized. He would have loved to have joined the meeting. And we also have the CFO online, as well as our manager for planning and monitoring and evaluation and reporting Ms. Pete. So I will continue with the presentation, hoping I've managed to share it. All of us are able to see it. Exactly. Can I, can I get a confirmation? 
I don't see it. I don't know other yeah, members. Because, because the problem is like, we don't know now the process. How does it go? Like, I, for me, it's very difficult to me. Like, now, obviously, the, all the processes and the different steps that you're oh, taking are now totally different now from what we are used oh, to. Oh, so, like, how, like how, how, going forward, what should what, what, what should we expect? Maybe that's what I should ask, actually. Like, maybe I should ask that, like, you know, like, what, what, what would be the steps that would be? Honorable members. Okay. Hello. Who can hear you, Chairperson? Chairperson, we no, but chair. I don't know what is going on. I'm hearing Honorable Machesi like she's on the other meeting or what is going on, and I don't get to see the presentation on, from my side. Chair, we do see the presentation. Yeah. Also, we hear Honorable Machesi. Can you please call her to order? <laughs> Honorable Machesi, are you there, my sister? You won't see the presentation on the screen. Why? But Why we can't see I see it? We see the presentation. We do, we do see the presentation, Chair. The I see it now. Good. I see it now. Honorable Machesi? Okay. okay. No, it's fine then. Can we? Can you continue, uh, Mamukalan? CEO, are you there? CEO? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Sorry, sorry. My apologies. Uh, it was okay, the speaker. You can, you can start, me, Kim. Okay. Uh, I was, I introduced the delegation from SAIS in terms of uh, the leader who's councillor Ntantala is member of the executive. And I've also made an apology on behalf of our council chairperson who's got a bereavement. His uncle just passed on last night, he couldn't, so therefore he couldn't join us. We are also having the CFO who will share the presentation with me. I'll hand over to him when I come to the finances, as well as our manager for planning, M&E and reporting, Ms. Opete. Uh, Chair, we are presenting to you the 2020-2021 as well as the 2020-2025 uh, strategic plan and APP, as well as the budget that were tabled to Parliament on the 11th of March, 2020. However, we are uh, making members aware that obviously as we present, there will be some bit of deviation in terms of the challenges and risks that are posed by COVID-19 and we'll be able to mention those against certain indicators that might be affected. And in addition to that, we'll be able to indicate the necessary mitigating strategies that we are taking to be able to, to resolve some of the issues that we might be faced with. That is the presentation outline. I won't go through it. The first part, Chair, is just to give you background in terms of our policy and legislative environment and mandate. But just to begin by indicating that SACE is a self statutory self-regulation uh, regulatory professional body in the teaching profession, which is which means is a council that is uh, led by teachers for the teachers or profession for the profession. And therefore, in terms of our mandate, one of the key three issues that uh, we are mandated by the NDP to focus on are the issue of making sure that the teaching profession has got professional standards. And as I, as I present, you'll be able to hear some of the issues that we are working on with regard to that particular area. Also, as we register educators, we need to certify them. Previously, we've been registering them on the basis of the paper that they are, they are, present, they are producing in terms of the certificate. 
However, we are working with the DBE in terms of induction and other processes to make sure that we really step up our own registration process and not only register for the sake of having a register, but move in terms of certifying teachers and make sure that we deal with issues of professional competence. The issue of recertification, it's something that we are consulting our stakeholders on. This is about making sure that you don't become a, a, a professional member of SAIS for life. At least you need to be updating your professional registration process through the maintenance of your prof continuing professional development. And that's something that we want to bring into the profession and link. And obviously we need to make sure that there's provisioning of quality continuum professional development. I'm not going to go through the legislations that I've highlighted on the slide, but just to indicate that uh, we are a statutory body that obviously is regulated by the SACE Act or governed by SACE Act of 2000. Also, the NQF Act has got an impact on, on us, including the National Policy Framework on Teacher Education that is speaking purely to issues of continuum professional teacher development as well as your integrated strategic planning framework on teacher education and development. The other legislations are critical for us, yes, because we need to be working on issues of ECD, early childhood development, and also the registration of other people outside the basic education in terms of your TVET lecturers and also your community education and training lecturers. Clearly, in terms of our SAIS Act, we have uh, four different regulatory frameworks that we need to utilize. One, uh, the professional registration criteria, which is assisting us to determine entry into the teaching profession. And that is where the issues of screening are coming into the picture. And as I present on program two, you will see some of the issues that I'm referring to. The, the issue of setting and enforcing the, the, the professional standards, we've just developed professional teaching standards in the last two years. Uh, the ministry is assisting us to finalize them in terms of the gazetting process. And again, when I come to program number five, you'll be able to see some of the issues that will be dealing with. Uh, quite critical also in terms of making sure that teachers are kept abreast and they, they really develop themselves and the employers develop them is the managing of a system for continuing teacher professional development. And just to reiterate, Chair, that SAIS is not a provider of continuing professional development. The nine provincial education departments, the Ohio education institutions, and also other providers are providers of continuing professional development that we quality assure to make sure that they provide quality professional development in line with the NDP requirements, in line with the SAIS Act, and also other legislation. So SAIS, therefore, manage that system and ensure that teachers are participating uh, in continuing professional development uh, points and we are able to advise the minister, we are able to advise the profession if those things are not happening. Uh, lastly, uh, the one that is always in the media and all over, we, we setting and enforcing the ethical standards through the code of professional ethics that we have in, in the profession. So those are our key frameworks that uh, are there to make sure that we really deliver on the SAIS Act uh, as, as, as the professional counsel for the teachers. Who are we regulating as SAIS? Uh, there are, there are or, or let me say, it's important to mention that we regulate across both basic education and also the, t the, the higher education and, and training and science and technology. In terms of basic education, we're focusing on educators in terms of your schools, but also office-based educators. Very clear in, in offices, we only focus on those educators that are employed in terms of the Employment of Educators Act. Those that are employed in terms of PSA, we are not regulating them. And, and also we regulating the ECD practitioners. Uh, however, from NQF level five upwards, we give them provisional registration. And those with your B Ed foundation phase or, or diploma in great art teaching are awarded full registration status. 
across the higher education in the higher education sector obviously i've indicated we're dealing with lecturers from the tibet sector but also from the cet college and as part of our professionalization we need to make sure that we take care of the entire uh the entire teaching profession starting from when i say i want to become a teacher until i i retire and therefore we have been working with higher education institutions across the country both public and private and also your education dean's forum to make sure that we bring our student teachers on board currently we're registering the final year students only but you'll see as i proceed with the program that we are moving towards registering them from year one uh, however, we know that the sector is moving into establishing more and more focused schools in terms of the six administration uh, priorities. Uh, they are moving into technical vocational skills issues. And one of the things that we did as council was to realize that there are no, not necessarily enough educators that have specialized in those areas. And therefore, in various schools, focus schools, technical high schools, et cetera, you will still find those educators that are providing a service to the children, however, are not necessarily fully qualified. Therefore, we are registering those. And I'll give you an example. Houteng will have uh, the School of Aviation. If we are to, to regulate the, the, the teaching profession and make sure that we protect our children, it means negotiating with the Civil Aviation Authority and, and make sure that those teachers have do, those those people have dual registration from both their their sector and also within SAIS as a professional council. Obviously, SAIS mandate would not be effectively implemented if we don't have a formal institutional network or, or arrangements for for us to be able to deliver our entire mandate. If we are to screen educators accordingly, we need SACWA for qualifications. We need DOJC, we need DSD for us to screen educators against their registers. We need home affairs to assist us with foreign educators. We need UMALUSI because when they go and accredit accredited independent schools, obviously they need to work with us because one of the requirements will be to ensure that the school that they are accrediting has got a uh, qualified and says registered educators. Teachers employers are very uh, uh, critical to us, including your teacher unions, and obviously DBE and Department of Higher Education and Training. So, so that is the background within which we are working. And also those are the institutions that we feel are critical to us and also the legislation that is governing us. Coming to part B, which is dealing with the the strike plan 2020-2025, we, we analyzed our environment, we scanned it, and we, to a certain extent, saying our the image of the teaching profession, the status, the esteem, and the, the, the prestige, to what an extent, it's not at the level that it's supposed to be. And therefore, we concluded that we need to have a vision that will begin to really make sure that we assure the public uh, that we are there to protect them, we are there to protect the profession and make sure that it's attractable to, to, to everyone. Therefore, our vision for, 20, for the next five years is expiring, inspiring a credible teaching profession. And you can see our mission is focusing on our mandate of registration of continued professional development and also of making sure that we protect and maintain our ethical and professional standards. Let me just also, uh, Chairperson, indicate that we went back and said there's a need to have values for the teaching profession. And the values that you see there are not necessarily in order of preference. They are there alphabetically, if you've realized. We've even in the APP document explained that we are having where we've written them in alphabetical position and not necessarily in order of importance. And therefore, what we also did was to say to Department of Higher Education, when they reviewed minimum requirements for teacher education qualification, to say they need to make these values mandatory to all the higher education institutions when they develop their programs for the newly qualified teachers. 
so that we can begin to understand that issues of quality are very important in, our, in teaching our learners, issues of integrity and, and respect and tolerance, so that we don't have issues of, of the kind of issues that we are seeing in terms of violence in schools, in terms of the kind of cases that we are, we are getting. The program uh, budget structure that we have, you can see it has got five different programs. Program one is fairly new. We did not have it in the last five uh, years, uh, and it's focusing on sub-programs that are there to support the core mandate of SIS. And professional registration, we have two new, we have, we have the second new uh, sub-program, which is data management. The registration of educators and le lecturers has always been there. I think with the second one, we are saying we have huge data within council with regard to the registration. The, however, we are not utilizing it effectively in terms of informing planning within the sector. And therefore, if we can have an indicator that is dealing with data management and beginning to inform uh, the profession, the ministry and everybody else in terms of the status of the teaching profession, the profile of teaching profession will be quite helpful. The ethical standards program, I think I will also unpack it as I come to that particular program. And then we have professional development that is also having three different sub programs and professional teaching standards. Our impact statement at a higher level will be to enhance enhancing public confidence in the credibility of the teaching profession. Uh, our measuring outcomes, obviously, we know as an education, as, as a professional council, we belong to education and we also belong to priority number two. Uh, our medium term strategic framework priorities, you would see are dealing with in terms of the outcomes uh, effective and efficient governance that is aligned largely to program one which is administration the fit to practice registered educators and lecturers is linked to program two which is your professional registration and maintaining and ma maintain maintained ethical standards it's it's more about adhering to our code of professional ethics and therefore it's linked to program three which is ethical maintenance of ethical standards. Improved teacher competence. We are saying one of the reasons why we're having professional development uh, provisioning, we, have, we are managing a continuing professional development system, is to make sure that our educators are lifelong learners. And in that, we need to make sure that there is improved teacher competence if we are serious about the uh, 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 the quality of our continuing professional development. And therefore, you will see some of the turnaround issues that we are looking at in terms of strengthening that particular area. And uh, there cannot be any says or, or professional counsel if we're not focusing on issues of teacher professionalism, because they are at the heart of, of any teaching profession. And therefore, the professional standards program, which is the last program, program number five, is dealing with the strengthening of uh, teacher education and development across that particular continuum. Some of the key issues that are that will be informing the next five years, it's one teacher professionalization across the teacher education and development continuum. And I've just spoken about it to say there's no way that we can continue to focus largely on practicing educators and not necessarily uh, moving into the higher education space. And therefore, the, one of the things that we are doing with teacher professionalization was to develop a path that is starting from developing a criteria for one to become a teacher or for one to get into the teaching profession. We have a responsibility as council to define the kind of a teacher that we want to see in the country and also the teacher, the kind of uh, programs that should be offered in higher education institutions, the kind of a teacher outcomes and attributions that must be there when you graduate, and also the kind of induction that we need to give you, as well as the quality and competence of uh, the attributes and outcomes that you need to be having as you are in our, in our schools and classrooms. Obviously, we, we're saying the nation is promoting reading for, for learners, reading for uh, having a reading nation, and 
you can't have a reading nation, you can't have a reading, reading learners if you do not have reading educators. And therefore, we are going to, we've started that process of developing a virtual library for all the educators, irrespective of where they are in the country, to make sure that we inculcate the whole issue of reading, but it's not about reading only, but also encouraging them to write papers on their own practice, uh, exchange research to be encouraged so that you have the, the challenges that are in the education system being dealt with from the practitioner based, but also from the academic based. So you need the two meetings so that we deal with the issues very well. Uh, we, are, we are also saying the challenges that we are facing, especially with regard to teacher misconduct, the kind of cases that we are, we are beginning to receive are telling us that something is just not going well within the, the teaching profession. And therefore, we are bringing back the issues of values and ethics in, in the teaching profession so that we can deal with that. And obviously, for all these things to happen, there's, there's a need for us to have data, information, and knowledge that will inform, uh, that will make us to have evidence-based kind of advisory to the profession, to the minister, and also to, to everyone. And also critical to that is to have a comprehensive communication and, and, and integration strategy uh, information technology strategy that is integrated, especially within the, this uncertain and fearful period where we have the COVID-19, which is forcing us one way or another to amend the way in which we are working. Coming to program one, uh, that is a new program and it really is there to support all the other uh, divisions and to make sure that as council we have effective and efficient governance. Uh, this is the program uh, before I even go there. You'd see that because it's new, most of the, it doesn't have historical data. Only research has, because research has been under professional development and in the next coming five years, we are, we've moved it out of professional development because we felt that it needed to be supporting all the other functions within council, but also to support in terms of uh, the role of states as a whole, uh, as well as advising the minister. And, and you can see this program involves planning, it involves uh, governance issues, it also involves communication and ICT, and also the, the issues around corporate services within the organization. Uh, this, the next slide is, is giving you the quarterly targets, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, I've already indicated uh, that this, this is the program that is supporting all other programs. And it's also important because it's the program that must give assurance and safety to our own employees. Because if we do not do the inward analysis so that you have the staff that is, that is motivated, that is safe, uh, that is assured to be able to serve the teaching profession. And, and I've already spoken about some of the areas in this, this one. I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, the second program is on professional registration. Chair, I'm going to go a little bit slow on this one and program three because I know these are the programs that most cases we have issues on. One of the things that I did, we did when we were planning this was that uh, we needed to give you an example of 2018-19 where we had a target of 38,000 educators uh, but then in terms of the actual achievement, if you check our annual report 2018-19, we could only manage to register 29,765. And the deviation has come largely due to the police clearance introduction. Uh, because of the slow turnaround time from the SAPS, which by the way, we managed to resolve, we've got other processes to deal with that and also our collaboration with Home Affairs in dealing with foreign educators and trying to, to, to do away with professionally uh, unqualified people, but academically qualified who want to infiltrate the teaching profession. And because of those stringent measures, we've seen 
most of the people that were trying to take chance to come into the profession no longer coming. And this, that as we then planned and, and analyzed for the five, past five years, you, you would see that in 2019, 2020, on the next, next slide, in terms of the first indicator, there's a reduction of the targets between 2019, 2020, and also 2020, 2021. It was largely because we did a thorough analysis which gave us answers to say, no, there's a need for us to reduce because otherwise we are targeting, we are, we are planning and targeting very high, whereas the, the numbers and the outputs are showing something else. We are also reporting, Chair, that we've introduced an online registration system. It took long, but finally it's here, and it came at an opportune time when we are struggling through this COVID period. Uh, it's something that we are utilizing uh, currently. We have been testing it with all the student teachers, final year student teachers that we are registering. It was limited to them only, but during this COVID period time, we took an advantage to open it up to all the other educators. The second sub-program, as I've indicated earlier on, is on data management, uh, which will be able to give us the stats and also the status report on, on the standing and status of the teaching profession. Again, you don't have historical information because it's the first time. We are hoping in a year we'll be able to have two reports during the first quarter, sorry, first six months, and also towards the end of the year so that we can be in a position to say to the profession, to the education system, this is what we have in terms of the profile of the teaching profession and whether are we having the right mixture in terms of the shape and quality and, and also the size. Obviously, Department of Higher Education is doing a whole lot of work with DBE on that and says information will be complementing that particular process. And, and again, I know that there's quite interest in, in the issue of screening of educators prior to registration. I've already reported that we've been using the, the SAP as clearance and we are continuing to use it. Just to give you statistics in terms of since the 1st of January 2019, we managed to screen 35,181 up to around just before lockdown period because the police clearance is a non-negotiable. There's no way that you can register with SAIS if we are not uh, having the clearance. There are a few cases that we received which had uh, criminal convictions. Obviously, if you have a sexual related criminal conviction, we don't even look at your application. It's a no-no. However, there are, there are certain categories that we've classified to say, if you have this kind of uh, co criminal conviction, you need to appear before the Fit to Teach Committee, which is uh, there to assess the situation and check your rehabilitation process, if there's any expungeman. And on the basis of that, they can take a decision to say whether you can come into the profession or not. Um, also, the, the, the issue of DOJC, Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, you know, uh, through the Portfolio Committee, we've been discussing this quite a lot. Uh, the NRSO, the Sexual Offenders Register, and also Social Development is Child Protection Register. We, we, are, we, we need to announce uh, or report to the Portfolio Committee that finally, the Department of Justice came to us in December and declared that they are ready to, in fact, their, their National Register for Sexual Offenders is ready for use. And out of our ongoing discussions, we realized, we gave them our annual targets to say, if you are going to assist, says it means dealing with 35,000 teachers at least in a year. And we were giving them this so that they can test against their systems whether they are ready. I think most of you would be aware that uh, justice is using manual system. Although the data is on an electronic system, however, you can't do automation of saying, these are the six teachers that we are registering, let's automate against your system so that we can see. 
And therefore, that is a bit of a hurdle. And given that particular process of saying, it means if we're sending them, let's say in a month, about 2.5 cases of registration, they are likely to come back to us around two to three or four months. It's not going to be good in terms of us not registering their, our turnaround time and all that. So, so as much as the register is ready, the technicalities in terms of how to use that particular system is a problem. They need manual fingerprints on a paper because the system, it, they don't have electronic systems as yet. And therefore, what we did, we said to them, let's run a pilot. We, we, we took 60 educators and tested against that. Uh, it has been a month, and I can say be, maybe because of lockdown, they haven't come back to us. And you can check also there are issues with regard to internal capacity of dealing with this particular mandate. But at least we are going somewhere. That process is starting. We'll be able to give feedback in terms of how the whole 60 that we've already submitted as well. Uh, the, the, the DSD part, we're still not having access in terms of checking the educators. However, we are able to report to it in terms of our teachers that are struck off. And, I, and I'm giving you an indication, 2018, 2019, we gave them 32 strike offs. And also for 2019, 2020, we'll be giving them 23 strike offs so that they can be in the register as teachers who are not qualifying or as people, not even teachers, people that are not qualifying to work with children. However, we need to report that the DBE, together with all its partners, uh, teacher union says, ELRC, et cetera, have developed a protocol which is going to assist us uh, in reporting. And, and I think this will help us in terms of accessing the register from from DSD point of view. Also, there's always been an issue around how are we assisting special education needs teachers. Uh, previously, we've been having challenges, but going forward, we've put in place mechanisms and we've tested that to say there must be, there is a special uh, service that will accommodate them. There are not too many. So that is why it will be in, uh, important for us to, 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 to deal with that. We tested about five, uh, the blind and deaf, and we, it worked, and we're able to learn from that to say, how do we go forward? The other challenge that is brought, is going to, it's already been brought by COVID-19 and the national lockdown is that 75% of our educators have been registering through our national and the three, four, four national offices in terms of work in. But because of the social distancing and all the, the, the COVID-19 compliance requirement, we've stopped that 100%. And which means uh, we need to increase our internal capacity in order to manage or mitigate the challenge that might come with regard to slow turnaround time on, on what we'll be receiving. However, currently teachers are applying through online. They are, uh, we've got a dedicated email that for sending applications to the national office and also the provincial offices, as well as the designated drop-off areas in all the, the six uh, offices, national and also pro, pro, provincial. Program three, ethical standards. And this particular program uh, is there to, to really promote and maintain the ethical standards in the profession. Again, I'm using this table to, to drive one of the points that I'm going to come to. Uh, I'm giving an example of 2018-19 where we managed to receive 636 cases. However, there were 765 incidences in those cases, which means in one school you may find different cases or one educator who is charged with one or two different cases. And therefore, because of the, the, the number of cases that we are receiving, and also because of the challenges that I've highlighted in the next slide, uh, 
issues of unavailability of witnesses, postponement of, of cases caused by lawyers, and also uh, the cases that we received from provinces at the end of, towards the end of financial year. Remember, Section 26 of the SAIS Act says all provincial, all employers, not necessarily provincial education departments only, all employers must submit to SAIS all the cases that they've dealt with once they've dealt the, for the verdict and sanctions. So you need to wait for the, for the employer processes and once they have dealt with those cases, they then refer them to SAIS. This is something that is also creating bottleneck because then they come late towards the end of the financial year when they've dealt with them uh, for us to, 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 to finalize. Uh, historically, we've been having a challenge of carrying over cases mainly because of those kind of factors. And uh, the, the portfolio committee would know that we declared most of the rollover cases and, and I need to inform them and we'll see when we present the annual report that close to 97% of the three years carryover cases that we had have been concluded. We are left with very, 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 very few, which, which are also under process. And I think you will also see in terms of how we've subdivided the program three so that we can be able to manage particularly the issue of carrying over cases and being able to report uh, accordingly. Therefore, the, the first sub-program is investigation. Often you have investigations being done 100%. However, we get stuck at disciplinary uh, hearing level. And therefore, when we report, it sounds as if there isn't anything that we've done. Yet, we've spent a whole lot of money. You might have received 600 cases and you've done with all the 600 plus minus 500 and something investigations. So there's a whole lot of money that go into that. There's a whole lot of process that go into investigation and council, council subcommittee must also approve the investigations before they can be conducted. So we looked into that to say, also to manage the carryover cases, we need to have two indicators. Indicator one, percentage of investigations on new cases finalized. It will be the cases that are fresh, fresh, fresh. However, the second indicator will deal with the carryover. For example, the, the previous slide that I've shown, you've got 247 cases that were carried over from 2018-19. So if we are implementing or we are running the program, it means there must be those two indicators to make sure that as you deal with the new cases, you also deal with the lockdown and we are measuring impact in terms of how do we deal with that. The same would apply to disciplinary hearings. Across, we need to be having with those running parallel and, and be able to manage the, the, the issue of cases uh, rolling over. The other area that has been a challenge that we analyzed has been on sanctioning. Uh, and I think portfolio committee members would remember very well that even in the media, you'd have a situation where the teacher is struck off, however, you might be found in Pomalanga or Limpopo or whatever province. And, and also some of them would run to independent schools, some of them will do whatever. In order to, to make sure that we enforce sanctioning and we manage it, we track it, we said there's a need to have an indicator under subprogram 3.3 that is really, really, really uh, following up all the sanctions, whether they are fines, whether it's struck off, whether it's struck off uh, with, limit, with a certain number of period, so that at the end of the day, when we, on a, on a, on a quarterly basis, when we analyze, we can see where the bottlenecks are. Because remember, enforcement of sales sanctions is largely dependent on the cooperation of the employers. When you struggle off an educator, section 15, from the sales point of view, section 15 of the Employment of Educators Act is saying the employers must effect the dismissal. You can be, if it's not effected, because that educator is deemed to have resigned by virtue of him or her being struck off from the state's role. And therefore, if 
that uh, dismissal is not effected from the employer side, sanctioning then becomes a problem because the teacher will still will not have the license but can still run around in terms of seeking employment somewhere. So we're trying to 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 really close that particular loophole. Also, Chair, as much as we've managed to deal effectively with the rollover cases that have been happening over the years, and we are we are happy that we've done a whole lot of work, even in terms of our budget for ethics, is very clear that we've we've invested in this area. The the challenge that might be posed this financial year that we are reporting on will be due to COVID-19 because the investigations and disciplinary hearings are largely dependent on close contact. They are largely dependent on traveling across the provinces. And therefore, clearly for quarter one, I need to be very honest and, and, and indicate that that work has not been happening. And we know because of the uh, COVID-19 and lockdown restrictions, we cannot be in a position to travel across the provinces, even within Gauteng, to be able to deal with those cases. But linked to, to, to that would be that with schools uh, closed, it also means that it's going to be difficult to access the learners as witnesses. Without the witnesses, the cases will hang. They will remain open and will not be closed because you need somebody to come and attest. And with your grade 12s uh, having to leave the system, it means you're gonna even struggle more with the cases that in involve your, your grade 12. So we are looking at different mechanisms of dealing with this big challenge. Uh, we, we looked at the alternative of utilizing online system and we, we, we also looking at legal advice because the, the the legal people will tell you of its uh, challenges of issues of admissibility of the evidence that you'll be you'll be offering. So the advantages, the disadvantages are, are over overweighing the advantages in terms of utilizing that particular first system. However, we are looking benchmarking with other organizations that are in the similar uh, state, for example, your, your ELRC, your CCMA, the nine provincial education departments, and also other national councils. But we are mindful that when we benchmark with uh, organizations like CCMA and uh, courts and also your, your national, other national councils, they do not have witnesses to a certain extent as learners. So with us, we rely more on learners to, to be giving us evidence and all that. But be that as it may, uh, our council structures and executive are looking into this matter. There are robust discussion happening, and I know tomorrow we're having the ethics committee meeting to deal with some of these issues. Professional development chair, it's, it's, it's program number four. And this is the program that is quite critical to make sure that the quality of our educators uh, it, 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 it's really it's really good and also our educators become lifelong learners in terms of the current uh, stats that i drew on the 20th of march 2020 we do have 465,809 from the dashboard of educators that have signed up uh, for participation in the CPTD system. And I think you can see also per province in terms of how, how, how many teachers we have. Just also bear in mind, SACE is registering both uh, public and independent schools. Sometimes when you see the numbers that you are used to in the public system, it might ra raise some eyebrows, but we, we do take into account the, the independent schools. We're also having dashboards, a whole lot of dashboards I can even with qualifications and whatever. So as much as this 460 something thousand have signed up for participation uh, in, in continued professional development, the disjuncture is that you then have them participating in various developmental activities from the department, from teacher unions, from everywhere, 
even things that they do at school level and themselves. The disjuncture then becomes uh, the under-reporting or non-reporting of that participation to say oh, no, because no. this is, is, is responsible for managing their participation in continuing professional development so that professional, professional development points can be awarded. So, so the two slides are trying to show you that. So in order to, okay, it's also show, the next slide is also showing you the top 13 districts that are really, really taking continued professional development seriously and also reporting often to, 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 to say. And very interestingly, it's uh, about four, four provinces that are, that are doing that uh, consistently. But we are working with the provincial education departments to really make sure that, and also the DBE to make sure that we, we, we assist each other in this particular area. Uh, one of the things that we did in terms of making sure that we respond to the issue of educators not necessarily reporting their participation in professional development was to say, let's look at a model of having dedicated support program to and select a certain number of educators. And I will show you this slide to say, we said each and every province, let's get a 5% of educators who have signed up for participation in, in, in professional development. And out of this, we got 8.8 thousand. This 8.8 thousand are the teachers that will be supported the entire year on participation in continuing professional development in various ways, but also they will receive extensive support. There are systems that we put in place from uh, manual to electronic to initially we had face to face sessions as well, but I think we'll limit those. And one of the evidence will be them developing a, a professional development portfolio. One, it helps them to provide evidence on their continuing professional development. But secondly, it, it assists them in terms of being reflective pra practitioners. Because as much as they continue to record and reflect on what they have done, and, and we've seen this working, it, it assists them to really become proud, to have a culture of continuing professional development, also to become resourceful in, within their own, their own school environment. And therefore, in line with that, indicator number one, percentage of selected practicing sign-up educators verified for continuing professional development uptake. It's meant purely for that, so that every year we can select new 5% until such time that within five years we are sure that we've, we've really managed to, to deal with the theory of change, we've managed to deal with the attitude, we've managed to deal with the culture, of educators in terms of the reporting on and participation in continuing professional development. We are also saying at the same time, we need to make sure that we look into your final year student, uh, student teachers so that we sign them up for participation in continuing professional development while they are in higher education institutions so that immediately when they qualify, they don't need to start that process afresh. The other area sub-program that we are working on with regard to the CPTD system is on uh, member support. We are saying in addition to the 8.8 thousand that we've, we have chosen, the, there is a huge need for us to develop teachers and support them on professional matters. For example, issues of uh, uh, code of professional ethics. Yeah, we need to make sure that we, we continue to sensitize them, to orientate them, to develop them. Because one of the things that we've seen from the research that we've conducted on ethical issues was that the issue of space in, 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 in schools is one of the factors that is, is, is creating a conducive environment for sexual harassment. The issue of, because they've got labs, they've got... Uh, computer labs, science labs, etc., and also teachers that are having excursions and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and there are a whole lot of factors that came out of that particular research, and we are using that to say, how do we then support our educators not to do some of this, those things? But also because of safety issues in schools, 
in terms of violence, and we reported last year when we were dealing, dealing with the annual report to say, we've got a new program on teachers' rights, responsibilities, and safety. At that time, we were talking about research. Now we have the handbook out, which has been developed by says, but through the teacher's voice, teachers by the teachers, and it's one area that we'll be utilizing throughout to say, if you are confronted with safety issues uh, in terms of violence, but also safety issues now even more relevant in terms of COVID-19, what are some of the things that you need to do? What are your rights? What are the, what are, uh, the support mechanisms that you can find? Quality management is the third area on the, the third sub-program on professional development. This is the area that is, remember, says in terms of the, the, the National Policy Framework on Teacher Education, in terms of the Integrated Strategic Faith Framework, and also in terms of the NDP, is supposed to quality manage all, all professional development that is being given to educators. And therefore, approval of our providers is very critical and not only approval, but also the endorsement of our of their programs that they will be running. And thirdly, once we endorse them, it's not the end. We need to go on site and begin to monitor and evaluate the provisioning of the continuing professional development that we endorse. So those three indicators are speaking to those three areas. You, you can see the targets that we have. The one area that we are looking at here, which might, we might have a problem with, will be the contact with educators, the contact with the providers when we're supposed to deal with on-site uh, monitoring and evaluation. However, we are working closely with our communication section and also ICT to see the mechanisms that we can put in place to, to deal with that particular as, aspect. The last program chair is on professional teaching standards, which is linked to what I was speaking to earlier on with regard to teacher professionalization. This program is there to implement the teacher professionalization path that I've spoken to, to say, say as a professional counsel must determine the kind of a teacher that we want to see in the teaching profession, but also work closely with higher education institutions in terms of the kind of a program that needs to be developed to be responsive to the needs of the schooling sector and also the needs of, of the entire country with regard to, to, to teaching. So we have developed the professional teaching standards. Council has approved them. We have presented them to HEDCOM, HEDCOM approved and CM noted just to satisfy themselves with certain requirements before implementation. However, that is not stopping SAIS to continue with the implementation of the standards because council has already approved them. There, there are three different areas that we are focusing on because we need to professionalize across the teacher education continuums. Therefore, initial teacher education becomes critical. Uh, we will be developing the broader teacher professionalization policy, but also we want within these five years to start registering student teachers from year one. So we're working with higher education institutions to develop that particular framework, but also to go into developing a criteria for uh, entry into initial teacher education, move beyond using the EPSCO only. So that process is, is it's going very well because uh, the higher education sector is warming up to it. Newly qualified educators. Ms. Mokalani, my apologies. Huh? Ms. Hello? Mokalani, we, we seem to have lost the presentation. Can you just reshare it with us? Okay. Let me open it. Can you see it? Just give it a few seconds. You just have to press the share button. Yeah, I've, d I've done that. I'm not sure if members are able to see it, but uh, on this side, uh, we cannot. 
You can't. No. no. Nothing, nothing no. is visible. We cannot. Okay, let me let me close the share and go back, share, and then open. I've I've redone it. Let me... Mr. Brown, are you fine? No. Mm -hmm. No, Ms. Mokhalani, we are we still don't have it on our side. Uh, Hein, are you able to give us some guidance there? She's wrapping. I think let her talk to the document. We will note as she's speaking. Because, she's yeah, because I'm coming to an end. Can I continue or wait? If it's near the end, I can see it. Is that the same document I have, Mr. Uh, Llewellyn? Yeah, it's That's the same. That's uh, Then I can see it from my side. So when I open it. On slide 55. Okay. Can everybody see it? Yes. Yeah, Bob. Okay, if you can just guide me when you would like me to go to the next <laughs> page or back. Thank you. Hatamai. Uh, Hatamai. Go to to slide. Uh, yeah. On 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 on. Can you can you do the slideshow? Boom. Okay. Okay. It, it, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, enable editing. At last. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, Papa. There we go, Sir Peter. Are you I don't see it now again. I don't see it again myself. I don't know with other members. Hi, I don't see it, Hi. Okay, I'm sharing again. There we go. It's fine. Let 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 me continue, Hein. I will use my the one that I was controlling. Then as I move, you'll be able to follow me. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was I was still on the newly qualified educators to say when they graduate, obviously they will graduate with some outputs and and out outcomes and attributes that are based on the professional teaching standards. However, we are working with DBE in terms of having a mandatory induction so that they qualify and, and, and uh, go through induction and be awarded the full registration status once that uh, induction is completed. So I know we've been talking about this. Now the work is underway, and the fact that it's in the threat plan, it's in the APP, we'll be able to monitor the implementation. The practicing educators, the one area that we will be working on, all of them, including myself, when I registered at SAIS, we registered once. Now we need to bring in the recertification process uh, which is a bit of risk in the teaching profession uh, from, from the labor perspective. Uh, however, the model of continuing professional development that we've introduced will begin to ease educators in and support them more so that they can begin to warm up into the recertification process. This is about saying all educators participate in continuing professional development and 150 points when they certify this they satisfy the CPT requirements, then they can be recertified in terms of the new 
registration. So that's so that is that is where I stop. Let me hand over to the CFO to deal with the resources consideration. CFO, over to you. Can I cancel the share? No, no, I don't cancel no, the it's share. Still, it's still continuing. Okay, thank you. CFO? No, no. I never thought it would reach that extent. Honorable Murat said, can you mute your microphone? CFO, are you there? Okay. Uh, let me see if I'm pro I say th I think if he's not responding, it might be that he's having problems. Maybe Hello. just Hello, Chair. Oh. Oh, you are in. Okay, continue with your, your section, CFO. Okay. Uh, I'll start on slide 60. Uh, slide 60 and 61, I'll talk to them uh, at, at one time. Slide 60, it's showing the medium term expenditure framework projections up to 2023. Uh, on that slide, we just want to highlight that uh, our revenue had been consistent uh, since 2017 when the council decided to increase its membership fees to 180 per educator per annum. It will only change in 2022 uh, once council finalize the levy increase which is uh, under discussion for now. It's at an early stage. So that will change our revenue base. Since this is a main funding of SAIS, uh, is the one which determine the membership fees, the one which determine our revenue change, mostly except when we get the government subsidy for CPTD. Uh, our registration fee still remain at 400 rand once off for foreign educators and 200 rand once off for South Africans, while all of them, they pay 50 rand for renewal or updates. Our main funding, as I've indicated, still remain the subscription fee, which is currently at uh, 180. The, the, the approval has been obtained from Treasury to subsidize the implementation for CPTD for this current financial year, amounting to 18 million. Uh, we can indicate that the research budget, as uh, the CEO has indicated earlier, is classified under administration program because of its support and advisory role. Uh, teacher professionalization was included under professional development budget, but currently now, when you look at that MTF projection, now we've taken it out, it's all, it's standalone now. Uh, the operational budget for the five provincial offices, including the two which are to start operating, we have currently we have three operating. There are two which are in the pipeline, Eastern Cape and the Western Cape, uh, their budgets are included in the current operating budget. The selection process for personnel has been done in March for the Eastern Cape. The, the idea was for them to start working in May, which could not happen due to the current situation. And we are saying that uh, as soon as we shift to level four, which will allow uh, people to move from one province to another will be able to implement uh, the office in Eastern Cape. The process to, to purchase its own offices, which was underway, is still in progress. The delay took place because of the current situation which we faced since the end of March. 
We have identified few uh, administrative risks which will affect this budget. One is that there will be a delay in the opening of the two planned provincial offices. One has already started in the Eastern Cape. Although Western Cape was a little bit far ahead, but it will be affected uh, due to the fact that time is lapsing while we are still trying to change our gears uh, to find a way in which we can continue preparing those offices. What we'll do in the meantime, uh, because of this delay, we'll do what is viable in terms of preparatory work until movement is viable. Is then that will go ahead in opening the offices. The first one will be Western Cape, Eastern Cape, which was uh, ready, just that we just need to move people in and start working and launch the office. Uh, one other risk is that the IT infrastructure is not adequate to aid the full mandatory functions. So what we can do to mitigate that is to increase the capacity of the IT infrastructure and we'll do outsourcing of some of the IT services when necessary. The next point is the delay in the adjudication of bids which were in progress. What we'll do, we'll obtain approval of the extension of the current contracts when necessary, and we'll postpone some of the conclusion dates of the bids uh, through advertisement, the same advertisement channel that we use to advertise the bids. Uh, we'll also uh, face the increased consultation services owing to the change of business uh, practices that uh, we, have, we are facing at the moment. To, to mitigate that, we have to do some budget adjustment accordingly. Uh, our revenue uh, will remain the same. It won't change. We have nowhere to go and ask for money and we get it. What will uh, and we hope will survive, will do the environment, which means we'll adjust from one account to another uh, in line with the change of the business uh, practices that we, we find ourselves changing now due to the current situation. Uh, we, we foresee unplanned surpluses in some of the line items which we're going to uh, mitigate by doing budget, budget adjustments to adjust the effect of the change of business operation. during That will be done during this May sessions when the committees meet. The possible contribution to the COVID-19 Solidarity Fund will also be part of the budget adjustment, which will be discussed by committees uh, between this week and next week. Thank you, Chair. I'm done, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mapindani. Thank you, and thank you to yourself as well. Um, CEO, thank just you. To, just to mention to the members that um, uh, Honorable Sukars said she will join us later if she if she will find time. She's got other commitments, and then the the DG also uh, apologized. Um, um, I think he, his apology was not was not mentioned, and uh, he. He assigned uh, Mr. Parayashi to to lead the to lead the, the delegation from from the department. I'll allow honourable members then to to have a bite on the on the presentation. Can I note who wants to speak? Can I vote, please, Jay? Van der Waal. Malika. Malika. Morad. 
Dongeni. Ken Pacha Che. Pacha. I'll pronounce it correct this time. Tembekwa. Dr. Tembekwayo. At once. At once. Okay. Honorable members, uh, please straight to the point. No prefaces. Uh, Honorable Van der Waals, can you can proceed. Thank you, Chair. Straight to the point. Um, Chair, I'd like to just say on the budget, um, obviously we also, the entity says, um, expects uh, some budget cuts. And I would just like to know if they have started preparing where uh, the cuts would be and how it will affect them, how, how would they amend or adjust. My, my, my other question is, on the last slide, I think it's very noble to contribute to the Solidarity Fund. My question just is this, sir. Can you please explain to us, is that coming from your members' contribution? Because I can't see that it is correct to take DBE's financial contribution to SAIS and give back then. Um, because surely you can't use government money by donating. It must come from somewhere else. Can I just get clarity on that? And what amount are you envisage? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Van Honorable Maleka? Uh, thank you, Chairperson. First, Chairperson, as the committee, we have to note since the appointment of the Chief Executive Officer, the entity is shaping up into a promising entity. We have to note that. Chairperson, I've got a question. Is there a link between the indicators expressed in the annual performance plan and the, the envisaged educator as expressed by the NDP? How is that link demonstrated? And my last question, how accessible are SAIS offices to the public countrywide? Mm -hmm. Does mm -hmm. every education district have a SAIS official to avoid unnecessary travel expenses by teachers needing support? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Anatol Maleka. Honorable Muratsetla. Chairperson, thank you. Let's take this opportunity and welcome the report from SAIS. Uh, the CEO, Chairperson, is talking about the research which has been undertaken on the ethical issues, values and ethics. It is true, we want to appreciate that, uh, because basically worrisome in the eyes of the public <laughs> when it comes to the teaching profession is the whole matter, yeah, the values and the ethics. And now my question is, um, is this research outcome accessible? Is, is it possible that we can access it and uh, possibly how? Uh, because basically what would be of interest is the research findings and uh, also possible recommendations. Uh, but of utmost, Outmost uh, chairperson, let it be the issue here, yeah, the causal factors. What could be some underlying contributory factors to this um, uh, devalued and uh, disregard of the professional ethics? Because sitting where I am, I want to believe that for every effect, there is a cause. Thank you very much. Thanks, Honorable Mura. Honorable Lutuli. Chairperson, uh, on the presentation, I hear that um, there are cases whereby teachers move from province to province, uh, especially those who are found guilty of. Um, child abuse. So I, I would like to know what is the department doing about it and what system are they in place to make sure that they don't move from province to province and they are easily uh, identified. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Lutuli. 
Datang apa? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Honorable Chairperson, thank you very much. Uh, on, on, on the effects of uh, COVID-19, COVID-19 in the investigations and the disciplinary hearings, mm-hmm. uh, one might want to uh, get a, a, a more understanding on, on how uh, uh, that, that, that is going to impact uh, especially because investigations and the hearings, uh, the sittings themselves, uh, are, 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 are small groups, very small groups, not more than uh, eight uh, in the average. So at one to one, I have another uh, understand that one. And on the ethical standards, uh, what evidence-based reasons? Have you identified for the unavailability uh, of the witnesses, uh, which gives the problems in terms of progressing uh, uh, with the discipline? And under CPT, uh, CPTD, is there no negative impact noticed uh, when you remove your selected 5% per province? Uh, uh, to, to, to have them uh, closer. And lastly, uh, is there a way in which there could be a better cooperation between the EL, ELRC, uh, the SACE, and then, then the, the department itself, uh, so that uh, we are sure that there uh, is, is, is progress because it's an old problem uh, that the provincial departments do not want uh, to, 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 to stop, to fail to uh, uh, give sanctions uh, as, as given by the ELRC. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Novo. Honorable Masesi? Let me just get the video. Uh, thank you, Chair. And also I'd like to thank uh, SAIS for the presentation. Uh, I just want to find out, um, SAIS mentioned that, you know, in terms of uh, when they, they have uh, decided on the, the outcome of the case, uh, that they basically t- s- they struggle to basically finalize the case and close it. I didn't ha- get, you know, the reason why you know, they, they have challenges on, uh, on closing cases. Um, is it because of, uh, you know, teachers, they don't come back, you know, to come and, um, and have, you know, the final outcomes of the case? But if it, I can just get clarity on that. And also uh, going back to the issue of teachers that are moving from province to province. Uh, SACE is saying, according to Section 15 of Employment uh, Act of, uh, of Educators, that... Uh, uh, they find that that like you know there they, they is a way for the teachers uh, to basically ignore the sanctions and also that particular school to ignore the the sanctions. I see uh, in that in that part as uh, a, a loophole uh, in terms of our legislation because then it means that the the learner has no protection from the from a, a teacher that has been sanctioned or that has been found to be uh, to be guilty of uh, abuse of a learner. So uh, I don't know if says have been able to identify that loophole and where do you, do they think that like you know it should be fitted in? Should it be on the Child Act or where should it be? Because then if there's nothing that speaks that is a voice of a learner that's been uh, you know uh, abused then clearly that we are basically failing uh, the learners that have been um, uh, that have been abused by a teacher because then uh, you know as you know that a teacher you know can move to one province the advantage is that they will find a job most likely because they they you know they've got the 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 skill skills like you know, maybe they've got math and science and so they are seen as a available teacher but then you know then obviously they'll find a job and ignore the sanctions on that teacher but then our our, our learner has been left uh vulnerable uh in in, in that case and and uh, there's nothing that is basically protecting them from those teachers and also the other thing is that you know we are going to see you're going to be seeing a lot a lot of backlogs and I think uh, we need to, as much as you're saying you don't want to bench- benchmark yourself with uh, CCMA and also the courts, 
I think uh, you will really have to find a way to say, you know, how do you deal with your cases? Because uh, currently everyone is going online. Um, I think we have to find a middle mm-hmm. ground to say, how do we go and have like, you know, online cases if you cannot have uh, virtual cases, if you can ha- not have uh, one-to-one uh, cases uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of like a court type of setup, you know, the one that you usually have as, as sales. The other issue for me as well is the fact that, you know, you've been saying, as far as I could remember, CIS has been saying you're going to have um, offices in the Eastern Cape and also offices in the Western Cape. In Cape Town, I remember that you kept on saying that you're going to have an have office. And up to so far, you haven't had an office, which is a little bit disappointing for me. But I think uh, we can, uh, from, my, from what, how I see it now, is that maybe we can use that to our advantage because uh, we are, you are going to see budget cuts certainly you're going to see budget cuts. So do you think it's actually wise to go ahead to open those offices? Because if you're not going to have, you know, your full um, staff component uh, coming into uh, into offices, so why would you, like, sort of, like, rush to have an office, you know, whereby you might not have a full component of, of staff because of social distancing, uh, you know, and also not be compliant with the requirements that are, are, are actually being put in place, that are supposed to be put in place to have an office. So maybe that could be another savings that we can come up with to say, let's put that on hold for now. Uh, and then, you know, because you've been operating without those offices up to so far. So why would you rush if you have these kind of restrictions that actually might uh, eventually be um, be imposed to you? And uh, finally, also, uh, the issue of, uh, you know, can you look at customers like having some kind of a cost customer service line whereby, you know, you can have, you know, teachers or learners calling you into your office? Maybe you can, when you talk about environments, maybe you can look into that because now you're going to have, you know, people maybe calling you, learners calling you instead of showing up at the offices or, you know, how it has been done um, in the past. Maybe, you know, we really have to, unfortunately, COVID-19 has put us in a position now that we have to really transform whether we like it or not. And we have to use technology to advantage uh, as much as we can. So that's, that's about it from me. Thank you. Honorable Dongeni. Thanks, Chair. My question is, what is the minimum qualifications to be met for a person to register as a teacher? The second one, how is SAC using a register to inform the country of the educator's supply and demand? Thank you, Chair. Honorable Baja. Eh, uh, eh, um, just uh, three questions from my side. One, um, in most instances, independent schools, um, you know, seem to be, you know, law unto themselves in most instances. Um, to what extent is that a problem um, in CIS in terms of teacher registrations or enrollment um, as, as, you know, as, as teachers should be registered by CIS for an example, by CIS for an example. Secondly, Chairperson, in terms of the dismissals, um, I know that uh, in the presentation there was reference to the fact that even when a sanction for a dismissal is reached, uh, it then becomes a duty of the employer to see that it's effected. So how does SAIS then follow up on such issues to make sure that uh, whatever sanction that was reached um, is followed up and implemented accordingly? So that you don't have people who, or educators who have uh, been dismissed somehow and yet still be exposed to our kids in the various schools. Um, the third and last one, Chairperson, is um, now we are all busy with the online kind of um, learning. Um, it says in terms of capacity building, um, it says ready 
um, that uh, our educators are in a position to occupy this space and make sure that uh, they do online facilitation for our learners. Thank you, Chairperson. Honorable Tembekwayo. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Can you hear me? Yes, you're can audible. You yes. Uh, my, my first question is, um, have the states done a research on the on their educators' needs of ICT requirements that would be appropriate during the COVID-19. And uh, the second one is how easy, how easily accessible is it for the educators to submit that postgraduate uh, certificate as a that will serve as a professional uh, teacher. And then the last one is based on the disciplinary hearings. And like I understand that uh, the process has been suspended, but the problem is uh, they haven't uh, tried the piloting of virtual disciplinary hearings. Why is it not possible for them to try and do the virtual disciplinary hearings piloting so that they, they, they don't have to lose the contributions of the grade 12s to provide evidence. Thank you. Honorable Adons. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, let me also join the queue and Welcome the presentation that we received from uh, SAIS. Uh, Chair, without wasting any time, um, most of my questions uh, are covered. Mm. Uh, also on slide 32, which deals with uh, 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 incomplete uh, 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 cases. Mm. Uh, many questions has been raised on it. I, I'll also need to, to hear what the... the Entity saying on, on on that because uh, there are number of factors uh, that they've noted uh, or presented that are affecting uh, the cases to be completed. So whether the question maybe that my, I might uh, uh, add on is whether is the status quo going to remain as it is, or is there any any plans? Uh, you know, to improve on on the challenges that uh, they are facing. I think one of, of them, Honorable Tembekwa, is just a mention a visual a visual a, a meeting of some sort for for witnesses to not to face with their their, their perpetrators. Uh, we know uh, if they are learners, it means they can be scared to face them. But uh, one of, of the questions also, it's on the, the accreditation and the registration uh, of, of educators, more especially those ones that are new in their system or from uh, a, a social development that we are migrating now to a basic education, your uh, ECD center, uh, centers uh, practitioners. Uh, the presenter said um, they only register from N2 level 5, if I heard it correctly. What happens to those ones that are, are not registered or are not qualifying, actually, are not qualifying uh, 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 to, to have the N2 level 5? What, what is it that, uh, what is the plan on them to improve or empower such to, to also be uh, recognized as as professional uh, as professionals in the in the education uh, system. Uh, Chair, um, I think those were the two the two questions uh, that I also needed uh, some clarity on. But I can uh, also just uh, acknowledge the the good work that they are doing and also. Uh, we see that they are investing more on the ICT as they are moving forward. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Chair, thank you for gotten Honorable King. 
No, no, no. I, I did not forget you. Um, it's now honourable. Um, I have said, I just need to correct to the meeting that I, I have said honourable Sukar has got other commitments. I read the message wrongly. She was struggling to um, to connect. She was struggling to connect. My, my apologies. It's going to be Honorable Sukars, Honorable King, and then Honorable Siwela in that order. Honorable Sukars? Honorable King? Thank you, Chairperson. I also only have a few questions. Um, my first one would be that since uh, we're having problems accessing uh, Part B of the register for children, um, why isn't the department then getting involved to complete the F29 form in order to have access to the register? Because concern would be how many educators that have entered the system so far has actually been vetted against the National um, Child Protection Register. So that's the first thing. Um, and then also besides educators, we also have psychologists that are on the system. Um, what provision has been made for psychologists and those that are not necessarily educators but are on the SAIS system to be vetted also against the Child Protection Register besides also getting clearance from SEPs? Um, and then what I have to say is that the ELRC have spoken to us and they said that they've got a one-shop system of dealing with cases because they realize that parents are reluctant and that learners are experiencing second trauma. Um, is this option that, will this be an option that say should consider doing or at least get involved with the ELRC in order for them to show them how they actually do the cases at a very speedy process. Thank you. Honorable King, uh, sorry, Honorable Sukars, are you there now? Honorable Suela? Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. Two questions from me. Um, is registration with says for professional teachers permanent or are teachers deregistered when they resign from the profession given the fact that the ministry has indicated that uh, they will probably allow people that left the system to rejoin to rejoin the system uh, due to the covid 19 in order to increase capacity if, if, if these teachers are being registered, uh, are they going to be re-registered uh, at the point of application? What's going to happen then? The second question is, given the challenges that the country is facing of COVID-19, obviously says uh, uh, will be affected. And my question in that regard will, it says perhaps uh, still on course to meet its planned targets for the year. If not, would they perhaps consider adjusting their APP? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Suela. Honorable Sukers, are you there? I think she's got uh, con connection uh, problems. But um, my, my, my issues that I want to raise, and uh, they, they are directed to, to, the, to the CFO, Tatema um, Pindan. I see on your, on your plans for, for distribution, uh, publicity, and, 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 and communication, you have budgeted 1.5 million. And can one just get clarity because your, the offices that are operational now are, are only three. So your publicity and communication um, strategy, are they, are they for all uh, provinces or, or what? 
And if possible, can we be at least given a sample of your of your distribution strategy? Because I, I am of the view that uh, it's a it's a it's a lot of money that we have budgeted, but of course you will respond and be able to 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 help me in understanding um, the the 1.5 million. And uh, and also, can, can we just get your your organogram? Because I think the the the, the most um, programs where you you are spending a lot of money, it's on your salaries. And um, which is which is about um, sixty-two million, and and you've got only uh, three offices. So if probably we can be assisted in terms of the of the organogram that you are you are you are you are hel- you are having. And the the second question that I'm having it's on your it's on your it's on your building. I understand you. You've got your your head office, which is in in Pretoria, and you you are mentioning uh, in your in your in your plans that you you are planning to to purchase a, a property. Now, I I can you just be informed or or be told? Can you, as an entity of DPE, now uh, purchase a um, a property? Because and in a layman's term, because probably it's me who doesn't understand how how this money then is is used and which I need um, clarity on, is that you are mentioning you are leasing uh, buildings, um, which you are spending five hundred thousand on, um, which you are you are you are leasing the the improvement. I mean, if if you are leasing and you are paying money for for a lease. Why must you then budget for a lease improvement? Because that's not your that's not your your building. It's someone else's building, and how I understand it, that particular person will have to improve his or her own um, a building. But also, you have budgeted about three point four million for rates, uh, electricity, and and water. Can 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 I also be clarified on 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 which buildings? Then is it the building that you are you are listing and 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 I think the amount is too is too much. Um, but when you explain that, explain so that I am able to understand. Like a, 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 a explain as if you are explaining to a layman person on the on the ground. And then you have mentioned as well that on the operational budget for 2020-2021, there is about 2.8 million, which is marked as a depreciation. I don't understand that depreciation and the 3.8 million, which to me is a lot of money, that is marked for, for, for a depreciation. And I think many members have alluded to the fact that Obviously, our planning now um, is is changing because of the situation that we are finding ourselves in. Because I also have noticed that on travel and accommodation, your budget, and and actually that's where also I need you to explain to me, because your budget uh, was estimated at 2.2 million. Um, I take it that your staff is moving um, um, from 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 Pretoria to the other two provinces and probably the other provinces, but you do not have offices in another province. So I don't understand how you how you must be working. But if it's two point two million that is budgeted for travel and accommodation, how are your officials uh, traveling? I mean are they are they flying um economic class? Are they flying business class? And what type of hotels are you are you are you are you are you are you using as them? as an entity. And the last question then is on the expenditure on your telephone is 800,000 um, that you, you have budgeted. 800,000 when actually everybody is using, um, because I take it even if we were not uh, exposed in this uh, 
in this um, period of COVID. The reality is that everybody was using emails before uh, it was an accessible way of, 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 of communicating. But your telephones actually are now, are you, you, I think 800,000, it's a bit, it's a bit too much. So I'm, I'm just uh, 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 directing my questions to the CFO because I think they are, they are really financially um, related. And those are the questions that I am, I am having. And then I would then give um, over to the, to the CEO um, to, to start responding on the issues that the members have, have raised. Thank you, Chairperson. I will, I will start with uh, excluding yours because the CFO will deal with it with Honorable Siwela. Uh, yes, obviously we did the risk analysis of the 2020-2021 APP. There are areas uh, where we'll definitely have to adjust. And, and, and in, in simple term, yes, we will have to, to look into that. But within the framework of the budget that we have at the moment. Uh, and also responding in terms of some of the mitigating uh, strategies that we've, we've identified so far. The, the issue of registration, if, if you are an educator yourself, Honorable Suela, you, you call says, you will be in the register, however, you'll be marked as not a, what's the term, as not a, a, a active. So the educators that we, we put systems in place because we knew and we've been in, in contact with the DBE, we knew that there would be educators that want, who want to return to the profession. What we need to do is to make sure that we follow the screening processes. They need to update their status. However, the requirements that we want in terms of making sure that we have fit to practice people in our classrooms will still be applicable. So that one, we, we, we won't compromise. Then there was an issue, uh, Honorable King of Part B of the register. Yes, we are working collaboratively with the DBE. In fact, the, the DG and also the Labor Relations Unit have been working hard to make sure that the issue of access to part A of the of the register, part B, sorry, is, is, is being done. Hence, I've indicated in the presentation that there's a protocol document that has been developed. Uh, between DBE, nine provincial education departments, Department of Social Development, Department of Justice, and also SAIS, ELRC, and other partners to make sure that we streamline our processes where we don't have access in other, for example, the Department of Justice or Department of uh, Social Development, that protocol will be utilized to open and easy some of the processes. Unfortunately, because of uh, this, this COVID period, we were in the process of signing for each and every institution. I know before COVID, just in March, from SAIS point of view, we signed that protocol so that it can be, we can be able to use, utilize it. Your therapist and psychologist also, remember they have dual membership. They still register with us, uh, but also with the HPCSA and therefore, we, we need to, we are collaborating with both, like I've mentioned before, we need to be working closely with uh, the relevant professional council so that we don't duplicate processes. We, we are looking into possible MOUs, obviously from the registration that we are already doing, but also how do we deal with uh, this professionals that are not necessarily CIS members per se, but they belong to other professional councils. So that, that, that particular process is being taken care of. Also the issue of ELRC, particularly when it comes to resolution number three of 2018, which I think they presented to you last year in October. I've been following that particular discussion. We took a discussion with the ELRC 
we took a discussion with the DBE because it was a, it's affecting both ourselves, nine provincial education departments, as well as uh, ELRC. The, the slight challenge that we have, it's a good model. The slight challenge that we have is that you still have a SAIS legislation, which is requiring that SAIS must still continue with its own independent processes. So we were saying until such time that we amend that particular part of us being uh, having a mandatory obligation to deal with our own cases through our own processes, we'll still have a challenge. But it's something that the principles between the three uh, groupings, DBE, ELRC, says, and the nine provincial departments are looking at so that we can see how, how we deal with the process. And I think the challenge has been the finalization of that resolution happened without says being part of it. Hence, we have implementation and enforcement issues that are cropping up after the, the, the implementation has been effected. So, yes, you will continue to have a child and as a witness and also a parent in terms of them being part of the case that has been done by the department. And sometimes, remember, these cases, they send them parallel. They will send that to provincial education department. Obviously, they send it to ELRC for ELRC to deal with it in line with the agreement that is there. At the same time, they send them to us. So we apply our own independent processes to make sure that we do that. So the challenge, again, hence we have the, 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 the sub-program three that is dealing with sanctioning, particularly for this kind of issues, to make sure that at the end of the day, when it comes to finalizing our cases, we find better ways of streamlining. So we are working as principals to see how we can bring our synergies together. The other model was to say, can't we use or sit in the same uh, hearings with the ELRC so that we use the same information to come to the final verdict? However, the, the, it might have legal challenges because we have the SAIS Act that is mandating us to look into things differently. But, but uh, both myself and the GS of the ELRC and, and councillors and also the, the department we are working on that particular era, uh, sorry, particular process. Uh, Honourable adjuncts, uh, the issue of ECD educators. Remember, in terms of the SACE Act, we are dealing with the schooling sector in terms of grade R to 12. And therefore, in line with that, our requirements were accommodating the ECD practitioners that were in grade R as part of grade R in schooling. However, what council did, realizing that we are having this migration issue, was to establish an ECD task team that is focusing on all the issues that will impact on the registration process, on the professionalization of the sector once the entire migration is in place. So we are busy working with DBE, with SACWA in terms of the articulation processes and also uh, with DHET because you may think that the main problems would be their employment or their registration. There's a bigger problem that SAS we are working on in terms of through this task team to look at the articulation process in terms of their qualification. Because if you're not working on the articulation process of those uh, uh, educate practitioners, you're going to still have problems in terms of trying to align them in, in, in the remuneration uh, processes of the ELRC and also of the DBE. So, so the collaboration between ELRC, between SAIS, DBE, and SACWA is very important to deal with all these issues as a package, instead of SAIS looking at professionalization and registration in isolation from all these other processes. Uh, the, the issue of incomplete cases, as I've indicated earlier on, it has been an historical issue that uh, I acknowledge it happened for quite some time. And that is why we took a discussion, we took an analysis to say, in order to curb 
this issue, there are, there are reasons that are beyond our control. For example, if parents are refusing, let me tell you, from the research that we've done, the biggest problem that we have is the issue of poverty. The, the educators, to a certain extent, that are involved in these issues are taking advantage of the status of our parents in as far as issues of inequalities, issues of poverty are concerned. And therefore, most of our cases, we have evidence to say when we are about to prosecute, when we are about to, to, to have a sitting, the parents then start to say no, because what happened? Bribery happened. They, they, they were given money. They were given groceries. They were given this and that. And when that finishes and our, our managers and whatever will tell you, then they come back to us to reopen the case. But it's one area that we said we need to look into the child protection uh, processes. We need to look into Children's Act to say, how do we deal with parents that are selling their children uh, for, for sex, if I may say, because it's, it's more about encouraging their children to continue having those sexual relationships with these, those teachers because they are benefiting out of it. And most of them, just to answer also, uh, can, uh, 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 Honorable Murat Settler, the, the issue of culture, most of them, they will tell you, because I've paid, what, what's your problem? Essays, why do you want to, 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 to be after me when I've uh, done what we call in Tlaolo or Hopatela? So, so those are some of the issues that we are battling against. And the other alternative is to say, once parents do that, is to report them to the SAPS, which is something that we are doing. We've been working with the, the gender for the Commission for Gender Equality in terms of those issues to say, how do we report these parents? Because the bulk of the cases that are, we are not being able to finish, if you check, you'll realize that it's more about parents that are refusing their children to, to, to be witnesses because of, of, of money, of bribery, of cultural issues that they are considering uh, as, as they go along. Uh, the disciplinary hearing for quarter one, 2020, uh, Honorable Tem Bekwayo, uh, we, we, we have suspended them, especially under lockdown alert level five, because of movement, because of uh, 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 the issue of contact, etc. One of the biggest challenge, parents, we've tried, parents are refusing to release their, learn, their children to become witnesses during this period of COVID-19. And especially because schools haven't reopened. So they are equating our role to want to continue with our work with the fact that why do you want my child if my child is not in school at the moment? Why are you in a hurry and not to wait for the schools to reopen, then you can continue with your proceedings. That, that The virtual disciplinary hearing a pilot issue, we welcome. It's something that we can, we can look at, even if it means doing it with a not the actual people that are involved in the case, so that we can just test how it can it can operate. Uh, we we indeed we are looking at all different kinds of institutions, and I take uh, the advice on 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 CCMA and the courts because when we check the courts, the courts uh, are continuing uh, because they've got the ten meter whatever uh, social distance. As, of, as compared to us, which are proposing one or 1.2. Therefore, it might mean also if we are going to have some of the cases that are done face-to-face, uh, -face, we look into bigger venues that will be able to accommodate that. But, but it's something that I can rest assured you, council is grappling with. Uh, the, the ethics committee is it's doing research, is looking at all different models and I know the ELRC also is looking at the online model. All of us will work together to see how we can be in a position to deal with, with that issue. 
uh, accessibility to submit PGCE. Uh, Honorable Tem Bekwayo, we put in place mechanisms to for teachers to submit registration even during this COVID-19 period. One of the mechanisms is online registration that I've already indicated that uh, at least through that one, we are able to check almost every hour and a process and be able to respond to teachers through emails. The other opportune time, opportunity that came out of this was that linked to this, we've started a process of e-certification. And it means we need to start now uh, publicizing this as widely as possible to the employers to prepare them. Uh, it will have the privy seal, which is a unique seal that you must have for, for security reasons so that it cannot be uh, forged by a whole lot of people that are manufacturing qualifications. SACWA is already using that, DB, DHET is already using that, and they are our benchmarks. We are working closely with them. We've gone to SACWA to see how the whole process is, is working so that we can make sure that from the online point of view, things are going well. We are also making sure that they can, we've got dedicated emails that they can send their process, their, their applications through, and, and that process is working very well. Even those that do not have access, they can drop uh, the, the forms in these designated areas. So we are assisting them. We are on Facebook, I think 24 hours, in order to make sure that if you can go to our Facebook, you will see how active it is. We've tried as much as possible to respond to each and every query that educators are, are raising. The issue of uh, research to check the needs, we haven't done the actual research. However, through the interaction with educators, we are able to begin to understand the kind of needs that they will have as we go along. Remember, our CPTD system is uh, online based. Uh, we've got the CPTD information system that has already been there. And we know which cohort of educators is struggling with regard to ICT from, from different perspectives. But I, but I think we welcome also the idea. It's something that we can look into given the fact that uh, it's unavoidable for us going forward to work on that. Uh, yeah. On, uh, Honorable Barca, the independent schools, remember I've indicated when I was dealing with program two that one of the things that we've done to keep that was that Umalusi accredit all independent schools. As part of their accreditation, every year they also go there to do the audits, to monitor and all that. So we have an MOU between ourselves and Umalusi because one of the criteria, you can ask any principal of independent school, is to say nine, between 80, uh, around 80% 80 of the educators that independent school must employ should be fully qualified and registered with CIS. So when they go and do their road shows, our registration manager travels with them and we are able, as, as, as partners, as pu the two public entities in basic education, make sure that we complement each other in terms of our, our processes. Therefore, Umalus is doing good work for us. Even when they go to independent schools to do accreditation, they also come back and give us feedback if there are cases of misconduct that has been put under the carpet. So, so that process is, work, is working very, very well. Uh, you raise an issue on dismissal in terms of uh, the, the, the sanctions, the follow-up. Every, every six months, what do we do together with the DG's office in the DBE? We send a list of all the strike offs. It doesn't matter strike off permanently or strike off for a particular duration. So what they do, they run our list against PESA. Because if you are in a public school, it means you're not supposed to be on PESA. You should have been blocked on PESA to start with. So 
the last run that we did, we had a comeback of two that were still in the system. And that those particular two departments that, uh, I think it was an error from administration point of view, managed to deal with them. But we are doing follow up to make sure that, uh, especially those that are in public schools, the private school ones are the ones that might take a chance. But what we are always appealing to doing, uh, appealing to, to, to the employers in the independent school is to say, before you employ, check with us. We are, we used to have a link that employers were uh, checking against. Uh, we, we realized one or two plots and we are refining it so that we can take it back uh, for each and every employer to deal with that. And the other thing that we are doing is to, even through the Bella Act, uh, criminalize uh, employers that are deliberately having educators that have not been registered with SAIS, or they haven't checked with us if these are really fit uh, to practice in our in our education systems. And I think that particular process will be able to, to assist us. Uh, Honorable, is it Yengeni, I think, or Yengeni? Uh, minimum qualification to register, like employment, is metric plus four years. However, we need to consider that within the system, you may still have our older educators, the, your 40-something-year-olds your up, who went through the colleges of education. And for one reason or other, they might have not registered at some stage. And you'll find one, two, three, four. But the bulk of the educators that we register is metric plus, plus four years. Research on educator supply and demand. That's exactly why if you check program two, we have data management. I said to the colleagues, we cannot have such huge amount of data if we are not utilizing it effectively to inform the system. And I, when in my presentation, I, I indicate that sub program in particular, program uh, two in, sorry, sub program two in program two, data management, it's exactly for that. Hence it says, we need to inform the system in terms of the status of the teaching profession, in terms of its size, in terms of its shape, so that uh, planning can be informed accordingly. However, I indicated also to say the DBE is critical in this. DHET is leading us as well in terms of making sure it works with higher education institutions on, on most of these issues. Uh, there's also Issues from Honorable Machesi. You you were talking about the issue of finalizing cases and 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 outcomes. I say th I think this issue I've cleared it up. If not, you'll follow up at a later stage to say what I was referring to. There are two issues. One, disciplinary hearings, which are not being able to be finalized because of the challenges that I've already highlighted, and also the pri the parents that are giving us. Uh, issues run around and all that because they are protecting uh, the money and bribery that they are getting from educators. But there's also an outcome issue that I was referring to that you correctly talked about in terms of Section 15 of the EEA to say you may have a sanction. However, the implementation of sa that sanction might suffer, one, because uh, of, of Section 15 of the EEA not being up implemented effectively. Uh, and, and you also raised the issue of uh, the, ignor the ignorance of the sanction and its implication on, on the protection of children. I think you are correct. It's something that we need to look at holistically and research it thoroughly so that we can inform the legislators in particular and also the ministries in terms of which legislation it is supposed to be. And I think you're going to find that obviously Children's Act must come into the effect because uh, it impacts on them. It's, a teacher is sanctioned, but moving from one school to another, obviously children are, are, are suffering. Or also the issue of uh, the SAIS Act 
somehow, somewhere, it needs to be amended to give says better teeth to deal with some of these issues. And and fortunately, there's a whole lot of research that I'm doing personally on around the enforcement of the code of professional ethics. And I think when that research is done, it will also be able to give us uh, ideas on how do we strengthen, especially the disciplinary and also the the, the sanctioning part of it. For me, there's no point of having a ethical standard as a as one of the lake of says or as 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 uh, the framework of says. It becomes a fetal exercise if you can't enforce the sanctions. It's it's as it's as bad as that. And and as a CEO, I'm, I'm, I can say it any day and any time because that is why it gives me sleepless night nights and it's one of the areas that I took upon myself to research and make sure that we really understand this area because then it, it wa it's a wasteful exercise, it wastes resources if you do a whole lot of investigation and hearings at the end of the day, when it comes to sanctioning, you are found wanting uh, in terms of implementation. Uh, I think the backlogs, uh, I've, I've already touched on them. I've, I've covered what you were raising to say we as we need to look at online and virtual uh, processes. I think I've answered I've answered that one, and also I take your advice to say as much I'm saying CCMA and courts might not necessarily be relevant, but in terms of the methodology, yes, we need to learn some lessons. However, in terms of the people that they are dealing with is different from our own context and that of the DBE. We are having learners as witnesses. We have par parents as witnesses. Uh, the implications might be different during this COVID period as opposed to what the courts are dealing with and also what CCMA is dealing with. However, we are taking advice and council will be able to, to, to deal with some of the issues. Customer service line, uh, hotline, especially during this period, I agree. It's some, we do have a call center. We do have a whole lot of numbers. Maybe we need to communicate them differently so that we can have a, a dedicated line that is dealing with some of the issues that you advise that we need to work on. Um, I'm, I'm trying to check quickly the area. Oh, you, you raised the issue of offices and uh, the, the CFO will report on Western Cape. Eastern Cape, it's, it's already Honorable Machesi. The only challenge was that when we were about to launch it officially to invite all the stakeholders and ministers and whatever, uh, the lockdown period came. We interviewed staff, we advertised, we interviewed staff. We will appoint as soon as we reopen and the office is ready just for us to say to the teachers, come and start functioning. So Western Cape is another process that uh, the CFO will, will, will deal with. Honorable uh, Ngovo, uh, investigation, effects of COVID on investigations and hearings. I think I've, I've dealt with this issue a lot in terms of how is it going to impact uh, on our work and the kind of issues that we are already dealing with. You you also had, uh, there was also issue of ethical standard evidence-based research on some of the reasons, and I, I think again, I've dealt with them. I've, I've indicated the issue of money, of culture, of bribery, but also on the teacher side, I've raised the issue of, of, of space, the bulk of them, especially on sexual misconduct cases, it's about space. It's about saying I have a lab, I have a, I'm, I'm a computer teacher, I'm a science educator, I'm a principal. And it even gets worse when principals are utilizing their offices for wrong reasons. It means I'm an SMT, et cetera, et cetera. It's also about your arts and culture educators and all that because they do have enough time to go out with children, it's sports as well. So those are the issues that make uh, the environment conducive and also the send and follow. But 
we've got a very serious psycho, psycho, psychosocial issue within the teaching profession, psycho, psychological issue. Some of the issues, when you look at them, you really begin to ask yourself if really, really, really these people are working in, in the teaching profession. So I don't know how, as a system, can we deal with the psychological issue that is underlying most of these issues that are happening within the teaching profession. And I, you know, I've given you an example of having a teacher who take a vibrator and penetrate a child, and every time she does that, she, and it's a, it's a she, she, she cuts the, 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 the child with a razor blade. I mean, for so many times. So those are, those are some of the things that you can see you're dealing with psychopaths, you're dealing with uh, people that are existing in a, in a different world. So it's beyond your normal reasons, like your, your money, your culture, your bribery, but there's a bigger issue that, that we need to, to, to find a way of dealing with it. Uh, better cooperation between ELRC, SACE, and DBE. I think I've already touched on that. Uh, there was an issue of removing 5%, which I, I did not get very clearly, but I think the chairperson, when you, you, you do follow up, Honorable Ngobo can come back with it. Uh, Honorable Lutuli, uh, you, you raised an issue of uh, teachers that are moving from province to province. And I think I've also addressed this one to say we send the list to the province to request them to to to, to mark them on PESAL so that the at least when they move from that province to the other, it can be seen. It's helping with regard to the public schooling. With the, with the independent schooling, I've indicated we are in, uh, uh, encouraging the employers to check with says prior to employment. And we are also trying to use the Bella Act to deal with some of these issues. Uh, and, I, and I think I've re responded to most of Councillor Morasata's issues. The research is available on the SAIS uh, website. However, we'll ask our manager for planning and research to send it to the secretariat in both the NCOP Education Select Committee and also the, the, the National Assembly Portfolio Committee so that members can be in a position to access that. Uh, the last two, uh, last one for me, it's Honorable Malika. Uh, indicators or, that are linked to NDP. Uh, in, in the introductory section, I dealt with the SAIS uh, legislative background and also the policy environment within which SAIS is working. One of the areas that, I, that I've mentioned is NDP in terms of three fundamental areas for SAIS. One, SAIS developing professional teaching standards for the profession. And if you check our APP program five, it's about that. It has got three different sub-programs that are looking into uh, implementing the teacher professionalization path across the entire teacher education and, and, and teacher development continuum. So the professional standards will underpin the teacher professionalization path so that as we go along, we can begin to realize the mandate of of, of the NDP. Secondly, the, man, the NDP is requiring that SAIS must, and it's, it's direct to say SAIS must uh, quality assure or quality manage continuing professional development. If you go to program four, which is professional development, all the indicators that are in that particular program are responding to that particular uh, uh, imperative or directive of, of, of the NDP, which requires us to quality manage. We are approving providers, we are endorsing their continuing professional development, we are quality assuring what they are doing, and we are also requiring educators to be acknowledged in participating in professional development by giving them professional development points and manage a system for continued professional development over a cycle of three years. So that's how that's how we we we, we're dealing with uh, 
the issue of linking the national development plan with the work that we are doing so that towards 2030 we can be in a position to report as council whether we've been able to deliver on what ndp requires us to do or not there's yeah i, th I think i've tried as much as possible chair to respond to all the issues that honorable members raised let me hand over to the cfo uh, to respond and also to check if councillor tantala want to add anything thanks chair before you before you, before you 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 give to to the CFO uh, CEO. Honourable Sukar is struggling to 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 connect, so she sent okay. me she sent me two questions. Um, mm -hmm. She's asking what what support um, are you giving to the teachers during this COVID nineteen period, and how are you empowering teachers? in terms of continuous development in the in the scarce subjects those are the two questions she asked okay uh, the, the last one empowering teachers uh, says is not a direct provider of continuing professional development as i've indicated earlier on it's the responsibility of the employers of teachers but also other providers however what we do we we look at a uh, largely the metric results, the diagnostic reports that are being done by the department, also the needs that are coming from other uh, eval performance evaluation systems within the department and be in a position to say to the providers, we can only approve you as a provider of continuing professional development if you put more emphasis in the following areas. That's how we, the, the kind of a role that we are playing. However, in terms of the actual empowerment of teachers, it's, it's more, especially on scarce subject, it's more of your nine provincial education departments, independent schools as employers and also, and also others. Uh, the, the kind of support that we, we, we provide teachers. I've indicated earlier on that we, we we are we receiving as many queries as many issues as many uh, yeah issues which are showing fears uncertainty hostility and you name it from the educators especially with regard to the whole issue of them not feeling secured not feeling safe not feeling that anyone cares when it, pertaining to the return to to the schools and and what we've done so far was to try and develop some of the materials and share them on facebook and also other social media platforms just to assure them uh, in terms of uh, this this particular uh, covid-19 on our uh, professional development uh, programs, you would realize that there's an area that is called, the sub-program that is called member support. And one of the things in terms of reviewing the work that we are doing, I said to the colleagues, we do have a mandate in terms of Section 5B of the SAIS Act to establish an educator assistance facility. As much as it's, a, it's not a mandatory function, but discretionary function, on the act, it's we are reviving it now, together with the teachers' rights, responsibilities, and safety program that we've already developed. The handbook is ready, so we are putting in systems to say how do we assist educators to respond when they are faced with certain conditions uh, during this period in, when they return to schools, so that they can be empowered to. To, to deal with this. In fact, uh, already after releasing those, we've got many teachers that have been sending us information to say, my principal is threatening me. He say I must come back to the school. This is happening. And we are able to, on a regular basis, to give them such, such, such kind of information. We are also lining up in the next coming two, uh, in fact, starting from this week onwards, live chats with teachers on Facebook so that they can 
raise as many issues that, that are there. The other area through research we will be looking at. But we now have four and a half minutes left for the CFO. And you're entertaining questions from a colleague who unfortunately is not even part of the meeting. No, but you are rude because how can she ask questions when she's not part of the meeting? She connects and then disconnect. She's got a problem of connectivity just like you can have, anybody can have. So what must I do? Because she wants to be part of the meeting. She, is, she, she, she was part of the presentation. And I've clarified that it's me who made a mistake and said that, that um, and said that she is not part of the meeting when she was actually struggling to connect. What must I do? Just then get the questions. No, man, no, 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 on a profound belt. You don't do that. You don't. Can you continue, CEO? Thank you, Chairperson. Let me let me uh, hand over to CFO then, and 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 Councillor and Dandala. To, to wrap up. CFO. Uh, uh, th thank you, uh, CEO and Chair. Uh, let me start with the travel and accommodation budget of 2.2 million. That uh, budget, it's, uh, it's for the flights, traveling for council activities, including all meetings of council and its committees as well as the executive office. So the 2.2 million is intended for that chair. Uh, let me go back to the other question so that I clarify. There was a question in terms of there is a possibility of budget cuts. Well, where do we think we're gonna cut? Because of the change of the, of the business operation, uh, it stands to be reviewed because we are not having meetings uh, on site as of uh, as as says we're having meetings uh, audiovisual as they're happening. So therefore, uh, that that amount will have to be reviewed, chair, uh, to ensure that uh, we 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 assist the other budget line items. The other place where we're gonna cut it's uh, under the salaries. We I've indicated we had budgeted for some for provincial office which were delayed to start we're already two months into the financial year so the salaries of those personnel is one which has to be cut uh, as well as the, the operating lease for one of the the office which cannot start very soon but there is one which uh, the eastern cape one which we had already signed the operating lease which is effective now uh, because we're supposed to take up the space in April. Then the other question was on donation contribution. Uh, against our own funding and the state funding. The state funding, how we account for it, it's in this way. When we were given 17 million and we used 16 million, the 1 million which we did not use for that particular year, we carried over to the following year so that it starts and join the new allocation. We don't touch the, the state money at all. We carry it over and use it for the purposes which it is it's intended for. Uh, the council will look at its own contribution if it decides to contribute. There is an issue of the offices to say whether we is it viable or is it wise to continue preparing the offices while now we we have an opportunity to look at uh, distance communication to service the, the educator, such as using the customer care line. Uh, this is the discussion which EXCO took yesterday. It took it in this angle to say, uh, this situation is bringing opportunities to us to change the way in which we operate, maybe to the better, for temporary or permanently. So which means, we have to do an assessment with these measures that we are using uh, to run our business. Which ones will remain permanent, which ones will, will be temporary, so that in, after this, what may not be necessary or, or viable, 
after the end of this situation of COVID-19, we will be regarded as temporary. But the ones which, in terms of the trends, and uh, uh, when you look at it, it's viable in terms of the costs and in terms of efficiency, may be regarded as permanent. So the council will consider the issue of, uh, more especially the Western Cape and the other provinces to see is it viable. But with Eastern Cape, that office were already renting. So if one is to be asked the question uh, to say, are you not having fruitless expenditure, will say for April and May, it's happening because we are renting that space unused. The only better way is that we are renting it, we are renting it from a school, which is a government entity. So the money is not going out of the government space. Uh, the other question was on the communication budget of 1.5 to say whether it's for all uh, offices or for the whole country. Uh, the communication budget, we are using a centralized uh, budget. Our communication unit has got a budget and a plan to address all issues which says needs to address throughout the country. So the 1.5, it's covering the whole country in terms of us communicating to the teaching profession. So the 1.5, in fact, in terms of the demand and the fact that we have to come up with a better strategy now because we are changing the gears, uh, may look to be uh, insufficient instead of it being too much. Because if we are to change the business, we have to communicate fully with the teaching uh, profession so that until they get used to the manner in which we operate. Uh, the issue of the salaries, the salaries is inclusive of all the other provincial offices. Uh, five of them uh, were counted in that salary bill. Uh, however, there was a need to say the organogram, together with the other documents that uh, were raised, will uh, forward the organogram uh, to, for the, to the committee. But again, this is another one which I indicated earlier to say it will have to be adjusted because we're already two months into the financial year and we have been spent in on the two provinces and one of them, uh, Western Cape, where we're still far behind because we're, in, we're still at the beginning in terms of preparation and obtaining the, the space. Uh, the other issue was uh, why do we have to, to have lease improvement in buildings which are not ours? What do we do when we get a building, they give it to you in any shape that you find it. It may not be in a user-friendly or uh, we need to adapt ourselves to use such space. So the lease improvement was intended to restructure the interior of uh, whatever space we get so that we are able to occupy and work accordingly. Uh, the issue of race and water. Uh, for which building? Uh, it's for only one, the rates are only for one building, which is in St. Chariot. So when you look at the cost, which looks to be high, uh, is the area where we are in St. Chariot and the size of the space we have uh, acquired, that leads us to be charged amount which is equivalent to the, to the budget check. Coming to depreciation, which looks to be high, it's true it's high, but that's a, just a transaction which does not take cash directly from the budget, Chairperson. But what happens, uh, you have your software, computer equipment, they are, they are period lifespan, it's three years, so their depreciation is very high. You have to write them off within that expected lifespan. And as you write them off, you are, that cash does not go away. It remains as an asset in our, in our books, which if we are to replace those assets, we use the very same cash to replace the assets. We normally take it to the, to the capital or capital budget. Then, uh, 
uh, a travel and accommodation I have answered. The issue of telephone, why does it look high? SAIS has got only one main switch board situated in Centurion, and we just use that. We use that switch board to run the other offices, uh, five of them projected. So we that, that telephone account uh, carries the expenditure of operating data, cell phones for both counselors and personnel uh, who are supposed to, to carry cell phones do, uh, depending on the nature of the duties that they are doing. And even the provincial offices, they are using the very same budget because it's a centralized uh, switch board. The very same switch board, it's the one which is connected to run uh, the call center of SAIDS. So that 800 uh, chair, historically it has been proven to be sufficient to do that. And it is worse now when we are to change the way in which we work, we have to look at that because uh, we'll save somewhere, it will grow up here. Like now, when we have meetings like this, we have to ensure that all councillors, they are connected in another way which require money from the very same account. So it will be reviewed this chair. Uh, I think I have covered all the ones which I have noted, chair. Thank you. Chair, I'm done. Uh, sorry, Chair. Hello? Hello? The connectivity is unstable now. Okay. Sorry, Chair. See you. Hello. Yeah, we seem to be having a problem. The lines are unstable now, and we can't connect to the chair. It's only me and you who seems to be hearing one yes. another. Yes. Okay. See you. Okay, I think okay. I think I'm 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 just I'm not MC or CFO. That's about Pindani. Oh, you are saying, Chair, that he's done, and at some stage we we lost you. But we we give it. Can we just give Councillor Tantala one minute just to wrap up for us? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, CEO. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson and honourable members. I wish to take this opportunity on behalf of SAIS and the Council to appreciate the opportunity that we have been given to come and make our presentation and that we appreciate the level of engagement uh, that has ensued during the course of the discussion. And uh, we are convinced that uh, this kind of engagement sharpens our own operations. We are also learning some of the things from the honorable members. I just wanted to say thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very I'm much, uh, Council. Um, CO, are you done? CO? She's muted. She's muted. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. In terms of the questions that I had, uh, Honorable Member, I'm done. There was only one question, if uh, time permitting, that I could not get thoroughly from Councillor Ngobo on the 5%. Sorry, or uh, honourable member, no, not councillor. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Babu Ngobo. The chairperson, it was a short question. 
uh, if I had uh, the, the CEO well when she was presenting, she said something like uh, under CPTD, uh, 5% will be chosen, identified from each province uh, to, 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 to come to a particular place for a face-to-face uh, interaction. And the question was, wouldn't that disadvantage uh, learners if it happens during contact time? Thank you. Okay, I get it. Uh, the, the five percent that will be selected, Honorable Ngobo, are educators that we want to provide intensified support on in terms of participation in the CPTD management system so that we can boost the reporting. But we have learned also that when you intensify a particular thing with a certain group of people, it has a, 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 a ripple effect of uh, marketing itself to other educators. So the face-to-face was going to be one of the, the processes. However, what we are saying is that due to COVID-19, there are other mechanisms like uh, dedicated uh, for telephones, uh, also the, the whole issue of online system, etc. We do have CPTD coordinators in all the nine provinces, which will be there to provide any form of support, be it virtual, be it online, be it telephonical, be it even face to face if it means uh doing it one of the principles that we have as says is that we do not uh interfere with teaching time and therefore any support that is given to the educators will be outside the teaching time if there are face-to-face sessions because the numbers are not big we are saying even if it means people observing social distance uh, requirements but being in a position where they can meet and assist each other. Let, let it happen. However, the bulk of it will be happening off-site through online mechanisms and a lot of other issues. And, and, and I'm hoping that this will be able to assist because remember the end product is for them to also develop professional development portfolio so that by the end of the financial year, they can reflect on all the professional development pro- activities that they participated in, be it from the employer, from the teacher unions, from the higher education institutions, and also from the various private providers. That will also help to inculcate the culture of professional development, the culture of re- being reflective practitioners and all that. Thanks. Thank you, um, thank you, CEO. I'm, I'm just making follow up on this five percent issue. Look, the, the teachers are investing a lot of money with you. Five um, percent. I, I, my view is that is, is 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 not is not good. I think that there needs just to be to be to be the the value for money. I'm not sure if CFO can I, you can get me. But I'm not I'm not satisfied with the with the answer that we have given on the on the on the communication strategy. Um, like I have said anyway, that I would ask you that you forward for us your you forward to us your your sample of your of your distribution strategy. And I I'm still of the view I don't know yourself as a finance person how do you view 3.4 million for rates electricity and water. Uh, being budgeted for 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 I mean even that outbreak you know if you you need to to break that out for us so that we understand what type of offices you are using that makes you to pay that much money I think it's a lot of money and 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 I think you must make us to to understand why you must pay 3.4 million for rates I mean that is not even leasing that is only rates and 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 electricity and water we need to get that information. I mean, we are we are approving a budget here, and we need to be convinced why must we approve a budget, and you need to, to convince us. 
So that information, I think uh, you will say information that uh, you need to to send to our um, to our secretaries as the as the as the as the members. I'm not sure if there are any members that probably feel that they are not properly answered. We are properly answered. Um, then I, 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 I am of the view that we are ending our, our meeting. Ending our meeting uh, uh, with, with the note that we will have to, to get the minutes um, next week. I would appreciate if our secretaries can make sure the latest Friday or Saturday we are getting the, the minutes for both this meeting and the meeting of, of last week so that we are able to adopt them in the in the meeting of next next week and then um, we are going to have a meeting then with Umalusi next week honorable members um, i i guess then that um, this is the this is the end of our meeting.